Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. Today we'll be differentiating between formal sector loans and informal sector loans. This is a very essential topic for UPSC economy, so let's jump right in. But first, let's look at the basics. What is a loan? If we borrow money from a person or an organization, then we've taken out a loan. Loans are also called credit. Why do people take out loans? There's a multitude of reasons for this. We can take out a loan to start a business. We could take out a loan to pay off debts. We could take out a loan to purchase assets like a house or a car. Or we could take out a loan to gain working capital and maintain ongoing expenses. Although all of these reasons sound diverse in their own way, there's one unifying element between all of them. People take out a loan because they need more money. So if we ever need more money than we already have in our pocket, then we take out a loan. But who gives out loans? In India, there's two main sources of credit. Formal sector and informal sector. As the names of these two suggest, the formal sector is authorized by the government, whereas the informal sector is managed by private individuals. Let's look at the formal sector first. Within the formal sector, there's two sources of credit, banks and cooperatives. We'll save the cooperatives topic for another video. And right now we'll only focus on banks. A bank is a financial institution and banks play two roles. So the people with surplus cash can deposit their money in the bank in what's called as a demand deposit. And it's called a demand deposit because the money that we deposit can be withdrawn at any time or on demand. Banks also give out loans to borrowers. How do they do this? So banks work out an interesting mechanism between those who have surplus cash and those who are in need of cash. It mediates between the two. So in the center here, we have banks. So people deposit their surplus cash in banks and the banks pay them interest, which is some sort of gratuity towards the depositors. It's a way of saying thanks. So they give them money on top of the amount that they deposited. It's a way of saying thanks for using our bank to deposit your money. The banks use these demand deposits to also give money to borrowers or to lend money to borrowers in what's called as a loan. So banks give money to borrowers and borrowers, they have to repay the principal amount at a predetermined point in time. And they also have to pay interest on top of the principal amount. So there's several pros of the formal sector. First of all, it's regulated by the Reserve Bank of India or the RBI. So the RBI is a government organization which handles all monetary issues in India. They play two main roles. One, they print out currency or they issue money as they're authorized by the government. And two, they supervise banks. According to the RBI, the banks have to have 15% cash inside at all times, at any given time, in case the depositor comes in to withdraw their money. This is called cash reserve ratio, CRR. And all banks have to have 15% cash reserve ratio at any given time. The banks also supervise the loan activities of other banks. So they have to give loans at a reasonable, affordable, appropriate interest rate. And they also have to offer loans to all walks of life. They have to give loans to rich people, middle class people, and poor people. Because at the end of the day, the loans could really enhance the development of an individual and even the country. The formal sector is also secure and safe. When we demand a loan from the formal sector, we know that our property is in good hands and it's also authorized by the government. So we can never be cheated or misled. There's also several cons associated with the formal sector. First of all, any formal sector lo loan requires various documents to be submitted. You have to submit proof of residence, proof of employment, pay stubs, and various other essential documents. 
and it also demands a collateral. So the problem with the formal sector is that they're very uptight in terms of security. They need a guarantee that you'll repay the money that you borrowed from them, which is why they demand a collateral. So a collateral is an asset that the borrower owns and they have to give it to the bank or the lender. Let's walk through an anecdote to understand this. Suppose we took out a home loan. And so until we repay the loan, the bank snatches our house documents as their collateral. And the bank has every right to sell the house and sell these documents if we're unable to repay the loan. So, th so this is how banks compensate in any situation where the borrower is unable to pay back the loan. Then they would sell the collateral. It's also called as security or security deposit. The banks need to secure their loans through taking a collateral. Now let's look at the informal sector. There's several scattered unauthorized sources of credit in the informal sector. There's money lenders, large agricultural traders, employers, friends, and even family. There's some pros related to informal sector. It doesn't require any formal documents to be submitted. It doesn't demand any collateral. And the loans are more accessible because it's not from bank. Banks are usually inaccessible, especially in rural areas, because most people don't even have a bank account. And although this has been minimized to a certain extent through the Jan Dan Yojana scheme, lack of bank accounts is still widespread across rural India. And most people make payments and store money in cash. So these are the pros of informal sector. Anyone can get a loan. There's no requirement of any formalities or protocols. We don't have to put any of our properties on the line. There's several cons associated with the informal sector as well. For one thing, they charge high interest rates since they're not authorized by the RBI. In fact, money lenders and agricultural traders milk money from the borrowers. And in most cases, the principal amount is far lower than the interest rates. There's no record of transactions, which could be very detrimental because the borrower could make a claim that they repaid the loan a long time ago. But the lender could say that, no, you haven't because there's no written proof of repayment. So the borrower could be washed or drowned in repaying loans. The borrowers are also frequently harassed if they're unable to repay the loan in a timely manner because it's not authorized by any bank or government. So obviously there would be no terms of terms or conditions. There's no terms of credit. Usually in the formal sector between the bank and the borrower, there's a peaceful agreement. If you don't pay the monthly installment in time, you get three warnings. You get a couple of phone calls and then the bank sells your collateral. But the absence of collateral in the case of informal sector loans leads to the borrowers being harassed. They could be pounding their door every day, demanding them to pay. They could ruin their public image. They could even kill them. They could compel them to sell their land or other valuable assets. And Usually, they're called loan sharks because they're like a shark. They keep following you and following your path and keep biting you until you repay their money. The main con of informal sector loans is the fact that s most borrowers are pushed into low-income debt traps. So why do we take out a loan? As I mentioned earlier, if we ever need more money, if we have an aspiration to get increase our income, we take out a loan. But taking out a loan involves high risk because we can never predict the future. We never know what situation we might be and we might be ending up in. And if we're in a bad situation, then we could be pushed into debt, which could be carried out for generations. In informal sector loans, the most common source of low income debts is the agricultural sector. Usually at the beginning of the agricultural season, several small and marginal farmers take out loans from the local money lender or their employer or the trader. And the reason they take out the loans is to maintain 
and manage their outgoing expenses. So they need several agricultural inputs for that year, such as they need to purchase the seeds, pesticides, insecticides, and fertilizers. So to purchase all of these things, they take out a small loan. And they promise to repay the loan as soon as they get their income, which is during the harvest season. But then formidable circumstances strike them in the middle of the agricultural year. There's a drought. Their crops dry up. They have no income during that year. So they have to push the repayment back to another year. So in the next year, they have to take out another loan to maintain the outgoing expenses, purchasing the agricultural inputs. And so they have two debts that they have to repay now. And so even if it's a normal agricultural year, even if the yields are sufficient, 75% of the yield would go to the lender because they have to repay two loans, one from this year and one from the previous year. And if this pattern continues with more bad agricultural years, they could be drowned in debt and they could fall into the low income debt trap. And while their intention of taking out a loan in the first place was to increase their income, they would end up in a worse situation than they were before. So these are the cons of informal sectors. So based on this, we can easily determine that the benefits of the formal sector outweigh the benefits of an informal sector by a mile. But according to the stats, 75% of rural households still take out loans from informal sectors. Why? Why is this so? Why is the formal sector so minimal in rural areas? Mainly because the rural households don't have any collateral that they can risk to offer. They don't have access to banks. And they can't handle the strict terms of credit that are offered by the formal sector. For the informal sector, these terms of credit are very laid back. And there's a strong relationship between the lender and the borrower. It's almost like a friendly, friendly relationship. The lender doesn't require repayment of a loan in a specific time frame. He's willing to accept any delay in repayments. He's very lenient and laid back. So this is appreciated by most of the rural borrowers. There's no strict terms of credit. There's no demand for collateral. And obviously in rural areas, the access to banks is somewhat limited. So for these reasons, the informal sector is so prevalent in terms of sources of credit in rural households. And this is why the initiative of self-help groups was uplifted. So a self-help group is a group of 15 to 20 villagers who pull together their monthly savings. So they agree to give 20 to 100 rupees each every month. And they pull together these savings and then they take out the loans from the group. So instead of going to a bank or going to a money lender, they pull together their own resources and they take they take out loans from their own group. So this is very beneficial because the interest rates are very minimal and it's more accessible for the rural households. And there are several benefits associated with SHGs. It ensures financial stability for women. So when this idea was first floated, the idea was that self-help groups should primarily be consisting of women so they can pull together the savings and start their own small scale businesses from their house, like hand weaving or building small trinkets or toys and any business that involves their handicrafts and their skills. So self-help groups definitely ensure their financial stability. And it also became a platform to raise awareness for several social issues, such as women empowerment and employment opportunities for women. So when the self-help group meets every month, it's also an opportunity for them to share their views on these pending crises. So ultimately, the self-help group helps avoid low-income debt traps because the interest rates are lower and they're not strapped to a belt with banks 
that demand collateral or these several complicated documents. And ultimately, a self-help group is like an intermediate between formal sector and informal sector, which is key to the development of loan loans in rural areas. So that concludes this short video on differentiating between formal sector and informal sector loans. I hope you had somewhat of a comprehensive understanding. As usual, thank you so much for watching. And until the next video, this is Nishal Tube signing off. Peace.